Uh, why did you say the vulnerable are the greatest in the kingdom? Um, I said that because that's what Jesus said. No, I, well, I, I disagreed with that, you see. <laughs> um, he, he, uh, it seemed to me that he said that the people who look after the vulnerable are his friends. If you welcome one of these, um, then you welcome me. That's, that said to me um, mm. that, that Jesus um, saw those people as, as being, you know, as important as anybody else and, and important to help, but not necessarily the greatest of all. Okay, so I would um, I would suggest that Jesus, as I understand him, does actually have favourites, and the favourites right. are what we've described: the least and the last. Though those that are vulnerable, those are those that stand on the margins of society, and in that text itself, it talks about how the last shall be first. And the first shall be last. I, I see it as the topsy turvy nature of the politics of the the kingdom of God. So, um, for those of us with power and privilege, and I certainly consider myself in that group. Yeah. Uh, the there's still good news of there's still good news for the gospel, and the good news is that the path to my salvation lies in standing in solidarity with those on the margins of society, uh, standing in solidarity with the, the least and the last. And if I can do that authentically at all, then you discover, I think one can discover in the, in the shared and common humanity that actually at the end of the day, there's a, a vulnerability in all of us. There's a leastness and a lostness and a lastness in all of us. And that's what we, we have in common. Okay, thank so you. So it's kind of the rich here sent away empty and the hungry here is filled with good things. Yes. Uh, but in this case, the rich give away joyfully and graciously with... Uh, respect and honor that that's what i would hope i think yeah okay um you're not going to argue with that no no i'm quite happy with that hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just wanted to give an illustration so when i was a methodist i had a bishop and one of the inner city missions in hillbrow which is in the heart of johannesburg was a ministry to the, the homeless. So on a Monday night, there was a feeding scheme and also um, doctors were available to, uh, you know, care for their wounds and everything. And he had this thing that when he, he um, kind of saw to any of their needs, he would always say thank you to them. Right, yeah. Which is an example of what I was trying to say in the gospel that they had given him a privilege. Yes. Yeah. And that they were his teacher. He always said, find a poor person and let that poor person be your teacher. Right. Yeah. I, I, I find it interesting that um, South African Methodists had bishops. Oh, yes. That's another story for another day. But I suppose as part of this gospel, the, the argument was that it was to help ecumenical relationships with, for example, the Anglicans and the Catholics who have that system. And they promised that nothing would change. So in the one year, they were just a chairperson of the district. The district is the equivalent of a diocese. Right. And at Synod, we all sat down and they just facilitated the meeting. Then they had their name turned to bishop. And at the very next Synod, we all had to rise at synod as they <laughs> came in <laughs> oh dear <laughs> the role hadn't changed just the name yes yes and a little bit of ceremony yes yes strange world 
Yes, very amusing. It would have been better if the Anglicans and the Catholics had followed the stance of the Methodists rather than the other way around. I think yeah. the Methodists had it more on more on the nose because leadership ultimately is a is a trusted servant. It's not a position. Yes. Interesting. Yes. yes. Might, might have been cheaper too. <laughs> I think it would have been. <laughs> okay. Um, next question. Um, you say that does if you design for the vulnerable everybody and everything will flourish mm, i believe so um can you elaborate on that i, I find that difficult to believe okay so I, I try to give some um examples of when that had happened in society around us to to prove the point so um, the one example, which is, is part of our current debate is, so the one example is just part of a recent debate in terms of universal design. So in, in this case, the needs of um, the disabled were the primary focus in how certain uh, town planning features were done. So for example, we notice now that there's kind of ramps off the street pavements onto the road. Uh, that was yes. for that was for uh, wheelchair access, and also you notice on buses now they have this pressure system inside where the side of the bus goes down so that it's level with the pavement, so that a wheelchair can ramp easily onto, onto or a pram yeah well that's exactly the point so it was designed for disabled people in mind but everyone else has benefited as well so for every one client which is the disabled person at least five other people benefit as well because on the bus system you know to cyclists and travelers with luggage for example and yes. parents with prams, they've all benefited yes. uh, from, yeah. from that system. And the same with the, the paving that now slopes into a ramp, even though it's designed with disabled people in mind, uh, there's a whole bunch of other character, uh, you know, a bunch of other people that have benefited um, as well. So I think that was one example. And the other example was how if economics prioritized early childhood development the economy would flourish and that this is in fact the most um, cost effective way for the economy to flourish is to invest in early childhood development especially for the poorest of the poor yeah i, I found that a very interesting point i tried to look up your um Professor Heckman and couldn't find enough information on him. Yes, yeah, so um, I'll, I'll send out the, the links to the research uh, when I send out the sermon notes, but he, he did win a Nobel Peace Prize. And I read that much. Yeah, he's an economist, but what he did was he, he had a multidisciplinary approach where he also partnered with, you know, psychologists and neuroscientists and, and such like and it's called the Heckman curve so there's actual graphs that are available or as you say in Australia graphs that Hello. are available for download <laughs> which um, as a mathematician you might actually be be interested it's true it's true so the only reason I know about this research is again just because of my background in Johannesburg so on the basis of that research, the Anglican Church, I got switched over to the Anglican Church, as you know, but the Anglican Church uh, did a lot, uh, started a lot of ECDs, early childhood development programs, on, yeah. the, on the basis of that research. So there's many 
Anglican churches in the Johannesburg area that have started those programs. That was one of my first projects when I was a curate, um, first ordained. Yeah, yeah. I, I, those things sound like a wonderful idea. My only experience was as a student where we um, were encouraged to volunteer for a homework centre for disadvantaged children. And sadly, um, it didn't work. The kids didn't come. Obviously, there, there has to be, um, yeah, some better arrangement to encourage them to be part of it. And, and I think that would be one of the challenges. I think um, Hickman's point was, so if you're talking about homework, that's that the child in his view is already too old. He says yes. the, most, the yes. most important years are zero to three. Yes. Um, in some research and zero to five in other research. Yes. And it's a multifaceted approach to re remove as many obstacles as possible for any child within those years. And his point is just that we're wasting money on the other end of the spectrum with higher education if we haven't invested properly in early childhood development. That makes very good sense to me. Yeah, so I think that's another example how an entire country's economy would benefit just because a budget has prioritised early childhood development. Yeah. Okay. Um, next thing I was interested to talk about was Dan Price and his um, gravity payments business. Yes. I thought that was the most wonderful good news story. Yes. And and I I was was interested to read a little bit of his background, uh, his um, upbringing in a Christian home. Oh, you probably know more about it than, than I did. So that was... Well, I, <laughs> I was quite excited. If, if, you know, fairly conservative Christian home. And I thought, how sad that his brother wasn't as strongly influenced as he was. Yes, I think if we, we just read it in context. So we're in Australia, take for granted that there's minimum wages and you know, in comparison to the minimum wages in the USA, I, I would probably suggest that Australia is further, uh, further ahead. Um, and also just with the, you know, the support that government offers it, you know, America doesn't come close to any of that. No. So when he, there is debate at the moment in the US about making you know minimum wages uh, more humane um, but when he first proposed that uh, it was incredibly threatening incredibly yes. threatening to other businesses yeah other businesses uh, were angry with him because they felt bullied into complying whereas he was doing none of that that was just no. about his ethics and <laughs> his approach it was his journey and they took it as a commentary on them on yes. themselves they took it as a criticism quite a good criticism i would think of their own yeah. practice yes so so again that would be for me an example of how you've prioritized the most vulnerable in your in your company and everyone else has flourished there was a baby boom within his company. More people um, had children. Uh, more people bought homes. And besides the fact that the company increased its profit threefold, um, it, it just again it just again shows that prioritizing the vulnerable is is a is a principle beyond beyond just the gospels, even though I think Jesus may have been one of the first to, to um, make that suggestion. <laughs> well, I think it was more than a suggestion. I think it was a core value for Jesus, a core principle. Mm -hmm. But in, in thinking about it, I, 
I, I believe that we naturally do that as human beings. We've just forgotten somehow. I think we've been socialized into doing the opposite because if you think about it, when a baby comes home, when you first bring babies home from the hospital, doesn't, doesn't your whole entire system and existence now pivot around the needs of this tiny little, little baby? Everything yeah, else goes out the window. Your exercise routine, <laughs> you know, your, yeah. your socializing, your, your sleep, <laughs> you know. Even um, even how your house is set up goes go is centered around around the needs of of the child. Yeah, yeah. So we do we do know how to do it. I think just society socialized us in, into the opposite of putting ourselves first. Yes, that's a very modern thing, I think. You mm. know, the, the, the I, me, me business, it's, it's, not, um, it's not historic. No, I, I don't think so. I think intrinsically, and even from an evolutionary perspective, the, the natural state for human beings is to prioritise the vulnerable, is to be generous, is to put others before self because if if you think about it we wouldn't have survived without a species if we hadn't been doing that in the beginning we needed each other to survive and to evolve and that can only happen if you if everyone is prioritizing the needs of each other yes and the and the the ancient leaps forward happened when people got together in groups and worked together yes yes okay the other thing i i wanted to ask about and i've since i've turned the lights off because i thought they might look funny uh, the center to, for inclusive design um yes tell me more about them as far as I understand, it, it goes quite wide. So in that example, for the, for the first time, for what, what had happened was uh, software companies had tried to d do what I'm trying to, the point I was trying to make is prioritize uh, the needs of the most vulnerable in how they designed their, their products. And they did it by including a conversation with people who are disabled. Imagine that as a novel idea in, instead <laughs> of uh, presuming um, what the needs were. Um, you, you know, the-, the, the They disabled. actually- Yes. Um, and so the results were astonishing. So even though they had targeted their redesign on certain population groups, for example, the, the ones that I mentioned, there for every one of those that they prioritized, there were at least four other people who also benefited. And as a result of the inclusive design, obviously the the products and the software and the services had a had a far wider reach so at the end of the day their bottom line increased increased as well so that's that's what i um that's what i was admiring so so who are they and where are they microsoft and microsoft uh, and right. adobe right okay Yes, a software companies. I imagine they're in Silicon Valley, along with all the other software companies. With, with yes, with all the other super wealthy, new new super wealthies. Yes, yes. <gasps> they were as many questions as I wanted to ask. Uh, my only other uh, comment was: I, I loved your introduction about the 
the people vying for importance and clamouring to be in the front seat. I, I just just thought um, I, I should tell you that uh, my ex my uh, belief about the person riding shotgun was the poor bugger who couldn't get a ride in the coach where it was warm and comfortable <laughs> and had to, had to sit up the front in the wind and the rain with the driver. Yes. <laughs>